31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. So the language that Jeremiah uses has led some internet theologians to conclude that the new covenant must not be for Gentiles and that it's only for Israelites. And of course, that interpretation flies in the face of not just what the New Testament teaches, but also what the Old Testament prophesied. Let's break it down. So put yourselves in the sandals of the prophet Jeremiah in in the 6th century BC, right? What was he trying to communicate with the phrase, the house of Israel and the house of Judah? Well, we talked about how this prophecy was given after the kingdom had split and the 10 tribes of Israel in the north had been captured and exiled and the kingdom of Judah in the south was about to fall. And in the midst of this chaos and disunity, God speaks an incredible word of future restoration and hope through the prophet Jeremiah. In chapter 30, verse 3, he said, I will restore the fortunes of my people, Israel and Judah. And here in chapter 31, he promises that his new covenant will be made with the houses of Israel and Judah. So by including both Israel and Judah in his prophecy, Jeremiah is communicating that Yahweh's future restoration and his new covenant will include the entire people of God. And at that time, the way to refer to the entirety of God's people was the phrase, the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And when we get to the New Testament and the revelation of Jesus, we learn that the definition of God's people has been expanded. It no, it's no longer based on physical ancestry, but rather spiritual lineage. The New Testament is full of language that refers to believers as adopted into the family of God and, and as his children. Galatians 3, 7 says, it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. Romans 1, 16 says that the gospel is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. In Romans 3.29, is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. And Jesus himself, after his resurrection, commanded us to what? Go and make disciples of all nations, right? So the New Testament terminology for referring to the entire people of God is the body of Christ or the kingdom of God. And it includes everyone who's placed their faith in Jesus. Whether they're from the house of Israel or the house of Judah or the Gentile nations. In the New Covenant passage, Jeremiah... So that was Professor Solberg there on the New Covenant coming from Jeremiah. Of course, there's a lot more nuances to that. Uh, you could have included Ezekiel 36, 26 as well. But here we're just talking about who that New Covenant included. Was it just for the nation of Israel? Some people say it is. But obviously, as he explained, it goes a little bit further than that in, to include the Gentiles. Now listen to next part, preacher is uh, Andrew Farley, and he's going to give us a, a, an explanation on the New Covenant. And then after that, I'll uh, talk a little bit about the nuances of this New Covenant, some of the blessings that come through this New Covenant. Thanks for listening. Here's Andrew Farley from Hebrews chapter 8. This is a staple food for every believer. It's about the new covenant. I don't know about you, but I grew up as a Christian who never really heard about the new covenant. If you were to ask me what was the new covenant, I would have said, well, I guess that's the church down the street, you know, New Covenant Bible Chapel or whatever. It meant almost nothing to me, and I had never heard a single sermon during the first two decades of my Christian life, never heard a single sermon on what is the New Covenant, why is it so important, how is it different from the old, what is the big deal. And here in Hebrews chapter 8, we find a beautiful encapsulation it says if there had been nothing wrong with the first covenant, then there would have been no place for a second. But God found fault with the people. Nothing wrong with the law, but God found fault with the people. Now, uh, that's pretty incredible to think about because the law is holy and perfect and good, but apparently you put yourself under it and it's a nightmare. The law is amazing and it's a shadow of things to come and it was God given, but you put yourself under it 
and bad things will happen. What do I mean? Well, Romans 7 says coveting of every kind will happen. And Paul says, apart from the law, sin is dead. That means under the law, sin is alive. And so this passage in Hebrews 8 continues. It says, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made before. So get ready for something new. It's not going to be like what came before. Lots of people are arguing, oh yeah, the new covenant is just an extension of the old. Oh sure, we can put them together. An old covenant, new covenant, we'll have a balance. Maybe we should balance law and grace. Well, he is saying here, this new covenant will not be like the old covenant. Why not? It says very clearly, because they didn't remain faithful. So get this. The new covenant comes because they were unfaithful under the old. Now that means that the new covenant fixes the faithfulness problem. Do you hear that? The new covenant fixes the faithfulness problem. So if you have been depressed out of your mind, if you have been discouraged to no end, wondering what does God think of you and your lack of faithfulness, well boy do I have some good news for you. It's not about you. It's not about your dedication, your commitment, or your faithfulness. It is about God's faithfulness to us. And that's what the new covenant is. It is God swearing to God. The book of Hebrews says God could swear by no one greater. So he swore by himself. God promises God, and there you are. You find yourself smack dab in the middle of a covenant that God made with himself. That's what secures you. That's what gives you confidence. Not your promise keeping, but God's promise keeping to himself. Now, this passage continues. It says, I will put my laws or desires in their minds. I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. So that's a download. That's the new covenant. It's a download of God's desires onto your heart and your mind. Part of the new covenant is this beautiful download. You get the life of Jesus inserted, infused, placed inside of you, bonded to who you are, vine and branches, one with him. That's what the new covenant is, Christ in you. A download, you get a new heart, you get a new spirit, And you get God's spirit living in you. But it's not just a download. As we finish this passage, it says, I will forgive their sins. I will remember them no more. Do you hear that? It's a deletion. It's a deletion of your sin record. It's a download of new desires and a deletion of your sins forever. That's what the new covenant is. So if you have ever wondered, What is the new covenant? What does it mean to live under God's grace? What is the big deal? Well, the cross changes everything. When Jesus died and rose again, he brought us something revolutionary. It is not about law keeping. It's not about keeping all the rules. It's not about trying to be a good person. It is about living as a person who is inspired and motivated and animated from the core of your being. You're not having to ask for forgiveness over and over every time you sin. Your sins he remembers no more. You're not having to beg and plead and hope and wait to see if you're forgiven and if you get that nice forgiven feeling inside. He's taken them away once for all. As far as the east is from the west, he keeps no record of your wrongs. You're also not having to test your heart every day going, my heart's not right. My heart's not right. I got to examine my heart and test my heart. No, you can trust your heart because he's given you a new heart and a new spirit and his spirit. So when we understand the new covenant, all of that silly religious language starts to fade away and we start celebrating Jesus. We're peeling back the layers of lifeless religion, and we're celebrating the gospel to the fullest, the message of Jesus just begins to shine more brightly. 
and on the new covenant and the blessings. Let's begin by thinking of Jesus' words on the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5 and verses 8. He said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Yeah, what, a, what a statement to make. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. What did the Israelites up to that point in time when Jesus was speaking, what did they know about the heart? Well, Jeremiah in chapter 17 of verse 9 says that the heart is treacherous, deceptive. Who can know it? Who can trust it? Jesus goes on to show a bit later, uh, in a few, ver a few chapters later, that from the heart comes all sorts of wicked reasonings and thoughts and actions. And he talked about even your looking at a woman in a way lustfully is you're committing adultery, right? He, he got to the core of the issues that was holding Israel back. And yet when we look at the new covenant, it's really revealing the father's heart. The father, and I'm making this as a reference, is not Jehovah God. The Father is the one that gives grace. The Old Covenant emphasis on rules will cause the Jews to become bookkeepers. And aren't they bookkeepers today? They have not changed. The law was about rec recording or recording all your sins and a judgment condemning all your failures. This was the law. This was bookkeeping at its finest but Jesus says, God is not like that. He's your heavenly Father who loves you and holds you nothing against you. He yearns for his prodigals to come home. But the Old and the New Testaments are, are a story of two different gods. And when you can understand that, it helps you appreciate why the New Covenant is so much better. In my last video, we talked about the beginning of the New Covenant. It wasn't at the birth of Jesus. It was at the death of Jesus. We talked about how it was a better covenant. There are some things about the that the, the writer of Hebrews says it's a better covenant, a better made on better promises. There's a superior mediator than Israel had. Israel had Moses. The new covenant children of God with uh, have Jesus. Jesus is a high priest forever, seated at the next at the uh, right hand of God in heaven. Jesus' sacrifice was a once once only, one time only, perfecting, perfecting, right? Believers for eternal life, the complete forgiveness of your sins, past, present, and future. Then including in all that is blessings. Many Christians' friends don't know what makes the new covenant new, and as a result, they are working to get what they already have. So how can you tell if someone is benefiting from walking in the new covenant? Usually it's your identity. How do you view yourself is a good indicator, right? Do I see myself as an orphan, as a child, or as a friend of God? Is God, for example, my father, or is he my judge? If you don't see your father or God as your heavenly father, but really as, as your judge, then you're not fully comprehending what Christ has done on your behalf, friends. The new covenant, why it's so much better. I, I use the words from Jesus where he says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I used to think, what does that mean, blessed are the pure in heart? Do you have to try and get a new heart? I mean, how do you make your heart pure? To see God, right? I could never understand that because I was taught that you needed to work, you needed to study, you needed to pray, you know, med study, meditate, pray, go out preaching, you know, um, avoid all the sins to try and get this heart pure. <laughs> it just failed miserably, right? And I realized as I come to understand about the heart, it is a gift of God. Once you become a believer and accept Jesus, he gives you a new heart. It's a beautiful thing, really, because it's something that we can't actually do. It's not something we can actually fix. It's unfixable. That was the whole point about, um, you know, uh, Jeremiah saying that we have a wicked heart. Uh, Jesus saying out of your heart comes all sorts of um, 
unreasonable things or wicked things or bad things. I can't remember exactly how he phrased it, but that's how he puts it. Because an unbeliever's heart is, isn't a pure heart. But God, through Ezekiel, prophesied, and the prophet prophesied, that God will one day remove the heart of stone in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26, and give the person a heart of flesh. But not only that, he does that. But not only that, in Romans chapter 5, it says that he pours his love into your heart. And so you have this wonderful new heart because now you're a new creation. According to 2 Corinthians 5, 17, you're a new creation. You have a new spirit, right? So you're a new person now. So this is part of becoming a child of God in the new covenant. This is one of the blessings of many blessings in it. So, in the old law-based covenant, friends, you reaped what you sowed, basically. That was the criteria, right? There was a bunch of conditions, and you needed to plant and reap, and this is what you sow. But in the new, we reap what Christ has done, or what Christ has sown, right? That's what Second Corinthians 5.21 20, says, you know, he took on our sin, we became the righteousness of God. So therefore, grace, this grace, uh, declares that everything is a gift. Every spiritual blessing is ours. We have all the spiritual blessings. Do you believe that? And we're told that we've got to keep asking for God for more blessings. But we've got all the spiritual blessings. Where is that in text? Have a look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. It blows your mind away. You realize that, hang on. This new covenant, we've got everything. The Father has downpoured us with every spiritual blessing. Remember Malachi, people say, oh, pray to God and he will give you a blessing. Well, he's done it just because we believed in his son. This is part of the new covenant. It's not a covenant also of, re of work. It's a covenant of rest. That is our new identity. It's a covenant of who we are. It reveals the Father's heart because it's a covenant of rest. In the old, it all was, in the old covenant, was all about doing, right? But the new, because Christ has done it all, it's finished, it is done. Therefore, faith is a rest. It's not a work. Only when we rest, it is in the finished work of Jesus that God began a good, that God begins a good work in us. And at His grace abounds, good works abounds. Okay, as his grace abounds in us, good works abounds. Second Corinthians nine verse eight. Good works don't produce grace. So that's how we have been taught that good works produces a good spirit. But rather grace or that indwelling spirit will produce the good works. It's also a covenant of a new life, if you haven't understood that. The old covenant preaching will harden your heart. But the new covenant preaching removes the veil and reveals the Lord's glory. And as you behold him, you become more like him, transformed from the, by the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians 3.18 Under the old, what could you do really? What's the best you could do? It was a really a, a little bit of a self-improvement program at best, but it didn't last. This is the issue that many Christians are having today. Under, Christian, under the Christian banner. But in the new, guess what happens? You're made new. You're made new. Second Corinthians 5, 17. You're a new creation, a brand new person with a new heart, as we talked about, and the new spirit. Born above, born of the spirit, you are no more a prisoner of sin because when you accepted Jesus, your old self was crucified. Romans chapter 6 and 7. And now you're co-heir with Christ. In fact, if you look at his words on the Sermon on the Mount, he said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Yes, you're a peacemaker that God now has entrusted you as a believer that you can now do his will as a peacemaker because now we've, ex we've inherited this wonderful gift from God. A covenant of union. In the old covenant, covenant God lived in a temple you could never enter but in the new you are the temple of the Holy Spirit that's 1 Corinthians 3 16 
So you are one with the Lord as He is, holy, righteous, perfect, forever, as we are in this world. 1 John 4.17 We don't need more faith, more anointing. People say this, you hear that, or more of God. That's old covenant language. And yet we hear many Christians talk like that today, do we not? They're talking the old covenant, old thinking, bringing it into the modern day uh, talk. Friends, you are complete in Christ, Colossians 2.10. In the new growth, what happens is we acknowledge that all good things have happened already in Christ. We see that. This covenant also cannot be broken, right? Like the old covenant where it could be broken. This covenant can't be broken. It is not underwritten by our our promises to God like the old covenant was. But the new covenant rests on the better promises of the Father in himself. That's found in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6. In the old covenant, you loved God and forgave others because he was commanded of you. Remember what they asked Jesus? What is the greatest laws? And when he quoted Deuteronomy, he said, you must, you must love God, right? You must love Jehovah, if you like, with your whole heart, soul, mind, and you must love your neighbor as yourself. But in the new covenant, you love and forgive because he first loved and forgave you. That's found in Colossians chapter 3. So that's different even to the Sermon on the Mount where he's giving the Lord's Prayer, where he says, if you don't forgive others, God won't forgive you. Right? But in the New Covenant says, because now remember, he's under talking to a covenant people with their God who is Yahweh. But now because they're in the New Covenant with the Father, right? So now he's saying, in Paul says to the Colossians, because you've been forgiven already, Forgive others. Isn't that a wonderful thing? All our sins are forgiven, friends. Past, present, and future. We we looked at that uh, many times. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10 tells you that. Hebrews chapter 9 tells you it's by this sacrifice of, that our sins are forgiven, this blood sacrifice. Never leave us nor forsake us in the same book of Hebrews. We're told by Jesus that... None would be forsaken. Hebrews chapter 8, we talk, Paul tells us, now that we're believers, we are no longer under condemnation. And then later on in that same book, in Romans chapter 8, he says that God, nothing can separate us from God, our Father. No, nothing. His love is sticking to us like a barnacle, right? It sticks like glue. He's sticking to us that way. And when all things are said and done, when everything disappears, all your materialism, all your... Whatever, your friends are gone, and, and even if you're hitting the grave, we have this promise that God will never leave us. That is our security. That is our anchor. That is our hope. The new covenant is so much better, friends. And we're just touching on it. We could keep going on. These are just some thoughts about the blessings of the new covenant. You're a new person today. So as we go about our lives, what did Paul say to the Colossians? Whatever you are doing in your life, give glory to God. Whether you're eating, drinking, or marrying, whatever you're doing, do it at whole soul. Do it with your whole might, right? Because we, in this way, we are reflecting now Christ in us. We're reflecting the indwelling spirit in us. And therefore, we are people around us, surrounding us, will benefit as an ambassador of Christ living this side while we're still alive, right? This side of life, we can proclaim the beauty of the new covenant as believers or children of God today. So there are many reasons to be grateful and thankful of the new covenant. The blessings are... <laughs> we could talk all day, really, about God's blessings in the new covenant. Thanks for listening, friends. I hope it's been and informed discussion for you today. Take Friends, that's the final word on the New Covenant. There's many nuances of it. Here's a final summary from this brother that I found on the internet. Enjoy. It's about one minute. He's a really enthusiastic brother in Christ. Uh, and have a great day. We'll talk again soon. See you later. To take us to heaven. Jesus has given us a new heart. He has given us a new life. 
He has given us a new way. He has given us a new covenant. He has given us a new commandment. Everything has been made new, my friends. God has given us such a powerful breakthrough in Jesus Christ. You have been moved into the newness. Into the newness. A new heart is so powerful than the old one. In this new heart, we get to retain everything the Lord has spoken. Oh, this is completely fully coded. It is fully coded. A new spirit that knows how to move with the Holy Spirit. Because the old heart was evil. It was evil above all things. That, that, that was a state of human heart. But God transformed that heart to go after God.